Uh, our next speaker is uh, Matthew Borgatti, who's the lead scientist at Super Releaser, and is going to be talking to us about soft robotics. Groovy. Okay. All right. Yay. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Uh, so I'm going to be talking about soft robotics in space. So. Um, a little bit of this is going to be sort of theoretical, here's where it might be interesting, but a lot of this is actually determined by NASA put out an RFP. The RFP was like, we want to solve this problem and soft robots sound cool. Other examples are, here are projects that have already gone to space that are adjacent to soft robotics and where interesting material science properties have been used, um, dynamics of like cloth and interesting bits of manufacturing that also flow in with the field of uh, soft robotics uh, are applicable. So although this is going to be a like, wouldn't it be nice if talk, um, it's actually grounded in some brand of reality. So uh, I, why should you listen to me about this topic anyway? Um, I run a lab called Super Release where we make soft robotics. I got my start in robotics uh, doing animatronics for film. Uh, so I used to make movie monsters and now I make other kinds of practical monsters. Uh, so on the right there is a thing I made called the Glaucus. It's a demonstration of uh, soft robotic fabricating stuff. So it's all one seamless silicone skin with a bunch of chambers inside of it. And when it gets inflated, the chambers distort. And this is a walking quadruped that's made of one piece of material. So uh, here's another one of my things. So soft robots um, sort of have two main properties. One is they have compliant motion, and the other is they have compliant composition. So compliance is this idea in mechanics where you respond to your environment. So the way that um, you could respond to the environment, so like take a standard robotic arm. You know, it goes from place to place, and if there's a wall in between, a industrial robotic arm just goes <laughs> crashes right through it doesn't care. Uh, you can have it be compliant by having sensors on it to stop it from crashing through that wall. And you can actually get all sorts of interesting compliance if it has enough fidelity and the sensors are good enough, it can do all sorts of things responding to the environment. That's compliance. But the thing that's specific about soft robotics is they also have compliant bodies. They're actually compliant by their very nature. And so that's an interesting system for dealing with problems of like the human body. So. Uh, as you might know, space kind of sucks for bodies. So your bone density decreases in zero gravity. Um, your body is sort of tuned for the forces of evolution, which anticipate that all resources that you're not using need to be reclaimed to be put somewhere else. So if your bones aren't being used, you lose bone mass. A, your muscles also, because you're not holding yourself up against the force of gravity, you lose muscle mass, your eyesight. So uh, the surface tension starts becoming a dominant force in zero gravity. And so things spherize inside of your body because you're mostly water. So your eyesight degrades because your eyes change shape over time. Your snot and tears don't work anymore. And your heart gradually turns into a sphere. So this is how exercise is done currently on the ISS. So you have weights and you're pulling up against resistance or you're using bicycle machines. You're trying to get some exercise because otherwise, passively floating in space, you're using your muscles almost none of the time. So one proposed solution for this um, was uh, a skin suit developed by a team at MIT to try and squeeze the body in such a way that the forces are put back onto your bones, mechanically constricting you so that your bones feel some semblance of gravity. So if you can force the bones back together, it's possible that the pressure of that could cause your bones to start demanding resources from the body again and not lose bone mass. I think that one study that I read uh, was 1.6% of your bone mass per month in space. So they, they did a bunch of tests, a bunch of ideas with this. Um, so one interesting application for soft robotics in the context of space is that since you're able to dynamically adapt things to the body, you could change forces. Imagine you have a suit that can conditionally inflate or can conditionally vacuum. Um, one of the interesting properties of soft robotics is you can pull a vacuum on things to freeze them in place. So it's a property called jamming. 
So this is a soft robotic gripper um, by a company called Empire Robotics. The idea is that if you've ever had vacuum-packed espresso, it comes as a solid block, and then you break the vacuum on it, and it all turns liquidy. So one of the concepts that um, I've actually sort of been pitching uh, is it'd be possible to add resistive exercise-inducing uh, resistance, resistive resistance, that's a wonderful phrase. Uh, so you'd be able to add resistance to the body inducing exercise by actually using the jamming forces from vacuum on something granular like coffee grounds inside of a suit so that motion once again takes force. Essentially a aerobic suit for astronauts. So there are other problems because of space. Uh, now your soft squishy body doesn't like the vacuum very much and so we have suits, we have hard metal spaceships, we have lots of things that actually stand in between you and using your body to its best effect. So EVAs, um, as, as anyone who's been to space knows, uh, cause fatigue. Um, so your, your fingers end up gripping all day, you get tremendous cramps, uh, the spacesuit gloves apparently delaminate your fingernails over time, not terribly fun. Um, grasping and manipulating objects is pretty important. That's what you're there for on an extravehicular activity. Um, and your legs are more or less frozen in place. That's another interesting angle for soft robotics is seizing someone's legs using an exterior suit that jams and increasing people's grip strength and arm strength using soft robotics that are actually already in development. So there is an extravehicular activity. I always think that um, shots from the ISS make spacemen look like dolls. So this is a project from the Harvard's Whitesides Institute. It's part of their open robotics, their open soft robotics platform. Uh, so they've developed sort of a general purpose soft robot that you can easily make and sort of put anywhere. And so they've been doing strength and grip enhancing robots as a concept for therapy for strokes. But there's no reason that that couldn't also be applied to such a problem as increasing somebody's grip on the ISS. Here's a project uh, funded by DARPA. I think that's a Weiss lab project at Harvard. Um, the idea is to increase people's walking distance and carrying capacity by increasing their muscular strength by taking some of that load up through uh, dynamically stitched things. So you have a bunch of things that pull on these long lines that go through the body that are stitched across you so that this line pulls and it helps pull your leg. This line pulls and it helps pull your hip. There's another interesting project coming from other lab that's a completely soft orthotic. So the idea is this elbow bladder uh, inflates and it's made of ripstop nylon. And when it's inflated, it actually goes from being a completely soft piece of fabric to actually having tensile strength. The pressure pushing outward pulls against the tensile material and what they equal is something that turns rigid conditionally. And so you can have something that's made to be inflated in this position and you can, whenever it's not inflated, you can do whatever with your arm. And when you need that strength, it inflates. Another interesting concept that I'm actually developing with Final Frontier Design is the concept of mechanical counterpressure. So this is sort of a golden unicorn of spacesuit design. Very hard, very promising, but the body is a complex thing. So your standard spacesuit is essentially like an inflated surgeon's glove. The spacesuit is stitched in a neutral position. So it gets inflated with air to provide the pressure that needs to be on your body to keep all of your fluids from going other places. So a leak in a pressurized suit um, it can be incredibly catastrophic. Studies done on uh, pressure suits show that a micrometeorite come, uh, that fires into the hand of a pressure suit during an EVA could equal death within, I think it was an hour. So not terribly fun. Mechanical counterpressure is this idea that instead of having a cushion of air insulate you against the vacuum, it could actually be fabric conformed to your body so that you could dynamically stretch it in certain directions and have it remain unstretchable in other directions to cause your body to actually have this skin-tight suit that provides less resistance against you than all that pressure of air. I think it's about four atmospheres that's pushing on you in the spacesuit. These are some early experiments in the 1970s. Oh man, I, I haven't been speaking into the mic this whole time. <laughs> So 
So anyway, <laughs> so these were some experiments done in the 1970s. Uh, these are mechanical counterpressure suits that actually do work in a vacuum. It's estimated that you could get a one millimeter puncture in these from micrometeorite and not actually have it end your EVA. The problem with these guys is because they're constricting the body so hard, you can only wear them for about an hour. Uh, death becomes highly probable the longer you go. So not, not exactly something you'd want for, say, a six hour EVA. But the promising thing is they have advantages in what you can do. Obviously, these people climbing stairs and riding bikes and stretching over backwards are things that are very difficult to do inside of the standard NASA suits that we have right now. Additionally, they're not as bulky. So one of the huge advantages of using a suit that completely, can completely collapse flat and stack inside of a suitcase is that you could have a small suit that takes up very little room to do all the job that a current larger suit is doing, and all that space could be used for something else. Anyone who's gone up in the Soyuz knows space is a premium, even in space. So this is actually a mechanical counterpressure glove uh, from Final Frontier Design. Um, they've uh, tested a few versions of, this would be the interior glove and there'd be an outer protective glove over top of that. Um, but they've tested that in vacuum and is actually an effective counterpressure glove that yields less resistance on your grip strength than the current NASA gloves. And this is an interesting opportunity if we're already integrating soft robotics into mechanical counterpressure. The idea is you take body scans and you have something in between the body and the outer protective garment to dynamically take up the pressure and dimensional changes of your hands and fingers and arms and legs. Essentially, you would be wrapped inside of a robot. There's also the interesting opportunity for integrating strengthening materials inside of that, having it conditionally inflate so that when you're gripping, the robot is gripping right along with you, a soft exoskeleton. So anyway, that's me. That's where soft robots could go into space. And uh, I'd love it if you had any questions. Thanks. Any questions for, uh, for Matthew? If not, okay. Hey, so Matthew, clearly you've done lots and lots of homework. It's a hard problem, and it's great to be looking at it from different directions. Okay. Um, I mean, the suit, this, it's by far the hardest thing physically that we do, and gloves and moving the suit are you know, just one of the, the, the key things. I've heard. And, and, it's, and at the same time, it's hard for NASA to change horses, so to speak. You know, that spacesuit, it weighs 300 pounds, and I know. Yeah, which is why we practice in a giant swimming pool. But also, we want to make sure people are safe in it. It is essentially your spaceship that you are in when you go out the door. And so to guarantee, not there's never a guarantee, but to try to ensure that safety, there's a lot of checks, there's a lot of kind of heritage that makes us actually hold on to what you think of as a spacesuit when actually there are lots and lots of um, better ideas that are coming down the pike and have come down the pike. And I urge you not to be discouraged by the fact that we haven't changed spacesuits in some big dramatic way yet, um, because those times will come as things become simpler to adopt. And especially in something that affects humans, when you have different kinds of humans designing them, people who really understand fabric and movement and pressure and, and how to customize that. I think it's so helpful. So I was really pleased to see your presentation. My question, after that long-winded no thing, is uh, have you looked at the biosuit in, in The MIT project? Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's a little bit different than the one you showed, right? Yes. Do you um, want to just talk about that? You know, good, bad, whatever you I, like. I know a bit about the biosuit from, um, so I, I have some like loose associations with the MIT Media Lab, the friends in common. Um, I like a lot of what the biosuit has done, like the theory of, or the concept of lines of non-extension in the body, areas where it, no matter where you change your body position, um, the line running across your body will be exactly the same, essentially tailored lines. And knowing where those are to provide compression against the body, that's, that is an interesting innovation. Um, I think on the biosuit, most of the hard problems are left to solve though. So where the suit fits into the crotches of your body, where it seals, say, for the hands or for breathing, there's not compensation for respiration, which is one of the hardest problems in designing a mechanical counterpressure suit is your body physically changes volume with you, when you breathe, and there's no getting around that. I mean, un unless you fill people's 
lungs with liquid air or something, you're going to breathe in a suit and you're going to change volume as a human. And so although I think the MIT biosuit has a lot of promising concepts, I think that there needs to be levels beyond that to get towards a plausible testable suit. As far as I know, and I, I'm not the greatest authority on that, but I don't believe that the biosuit has actually been tested in vacuum. Sure. That, this is Ted from Final Frontier Design who designs uh, things that are tested in vacuum. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right that the suit hasn't been tested in a vacuum, the biosuit. And I think one of the big uh, challenges, the biosuit is definitely related to that Paul Webb uh, shot that you had of the space activity suit from the 70s. Same concept, mechanical counter pressure. <clears throat> um, one, one of the key things here is this suit has no shape change. It's just a lot of spandex and it takes a really long time to put on and take off. And uh, one of the ideas of the bio suit is that there is a shape change material. So once it's donned, it gets tighter around your body. Ah. And uh, the MIT suit has looked a lot at um, uh, nickel, chromium. Uh, nitinol. Nitinol, yes, thank you. So uh, when electricity is um, uh, run through nitinol, it actually shrinks. And they're looking at that as a shape change option. And I think one of the interesting things that you're talking about is, is using inflatables as the shape change. I think that's sort of a, a, a new angle with mechanical counter pressure. But the bio suit is current based right now, right? They get the conformal change in the suit by running current yes. through it, right? Exactly, yeah. My understanding yeah. was that, that as of now, they're having trouble getting that to be uh, enough. enough and also to be reversible. Like it kind of, it has a tendency to overly consolidate that they're, that, you know, that the yes. fine tuning is so not there. The, I know a little bit about the physics of nitinol. So you've got two phases of, ooh, nerd time. Um, so you've got two phases of nitinol. One is called the Martin Zittic and one is called the Austinitic phase and is essentially two different metal crystals um, that cannot happen really in a range. They're either A or they're B. And you can stretch out the hard phase once power has been uh, taken off. But once it's stretched out, there's not a middle zone. It's, it's one or the other. And so conditionally applying that so that you apply the right amount of force instead of here is, here is big suit and we turn it into itty bitty suit. Tempering that shape change is one of the keys. And that's one thing I think I have developed an interesting angle on. Through my soft robotics research, I have a method for sort of turning any arbitrary thing into a soft robot. So I've got this casting procedure that you make pores and you cast robots and you can make any seamless solid. Um, so I, I can make things of, you know, of genus zero um, that have any sort of shape inside and they have like an airport and the airport is actually where the core goes in to do all the silicone casting. So it's one seamless piece, really good for actually predicting you know, how it's gonna break down and stuff. The exciting thing about that is if you need shape change in a specific area, I can actually like do body scans, turn that into CAD, and turn that into a casting where I can create a pouch or a foam that actually specifically does a shape change that you can predict. So that, that's what I'm excited about to work on mechanical counter pressure. We got one more quick question. Over yeah. Here. Does your suit mimic the skin on bone? You know, your skin is an insulator of heat, right? Yes. And temperature. So does your suit has that type of mechanism? Um, I'm, I haven't designed suits. Um, uh, Ted from Final Frontier uh, is, is an authority on um, the insulation properties. What I'm specifically focusing on is how to resist pressure change. So one of the complexities of designing for the human body is that when you introduce vacuum, an even tiny area of the body that receives a different amount of pressure from the rest over a period of time will develop, I believe it's a hematoma, um, but essentially the skin will begin to delaminate from the other layers beneath because the liquid is pooled in that area and pulled it away. So one of the difficulties and one reason that air is currently used in the suit is air is just by default even in pressure. You know, um, you know gas will eventually fill the volume of any space kind of thing. Um, so the difficulty in creating a mechanical counter pressure up until now has been how to give an even skin for resisting the force of vacuum. Um, the rest of the forces that you have to battle, like loss of heat and the potential of meteorite strikes and radiation and all of that other stuff, um, is sort of 
to be determined. Well, yeah. I think the best thing to do right now is just to say, let's wrap up, because you're talking next anyway. Sure. So you, yeah. right? well, and let me just uh, add one thing here at the end, is you're, you're seeing how complicated you know, suits and, and things are. And one of those reasons is that they're, people are going to wear them. And I think the big thing to keep in mind is that we don't want just one specific size and type of person to be the people to explore Mars. And right now, suits limit you know, the, the size and shape of people that can wear them. It limits our selection of astronauts. And I implore you as folks that are thinking about suits, you know, all the interesting technical mechanisms that you're talking about are about making them fit people. They are so important because we need to bring, the, you know, everybody's, everybody to space. We need that whole uh, group of people to be able to go to Mars in order to really explore it like people should. Thank you so much.